Now, I want to pivot from that continuing series to this continuing series called New Faces in New Places, where we take a look at coaches in their first years at their new programs and what you can expect from them in year one and only in year one. We did this with Brent Venables and Lincoln Riley. We've done this with Marcus Freeman and Brian Kelly. And now we're going to do it with Dan Lanning and Mario Cristobal. And I'm going to tell you which dude is probably going to have the better year if I don't choose to push like I did in you know the first iteration of this episode where I let down producer Tyler Wojak and director John Marcus who expected me to pick a side instead of push. I'm like, nah, man, it's 10 win teams. I think so. All right. So Dan Lenning, year one at Oregon. Schedule breakdown, I think, is most important when we're talking about what you're capable of or not capable of in any given season. Their schedule is, I'm calling it at Georgia because the game is in Atlanta. They're calling it a neutral site game, but come on, man. Come on, ain't, 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 ain't no neutral site game, all right? And Dan Lanning got to come home because he was just defensive coordinator at the University of Georgia where they just won a national championship. He knows better than anybody else what lies in wait for him in Atlanta in September, okay? My man Jeff Schwartz had already chalked that one up as a loss last year, saying to me, hey, man, I just want to see how good we are. I want to see how we measure up because I don't expect to win. And I don't expect them to beat Georgia either. I expect Georgia to, to come out and want to prove that, yes, it was not a fluke. We are the defending national champions, and we expect to be here come January this year. Now, on top of that, following September 3rd, they got BYU Brigham Young coming to Austin on September 17th. BYU ain't no chumps. BYU ain't no easy win. I personally think that scheduling them ought to count like you know, we would put on par with a good SEC program, good Big 12 program, ACC program, what have you, because BYU would have run the Pac-12 had they been members of the Pac-12, which is another way of me saying, hey, Big, Big 12, better watch your back. Bring them young, come through, because they on their way. Kalani Sataki's been doing a great job keeping that program exactly where they expect to be. They had a first-round pick a quarterback a couple years back. They've been turning out pretty doggone good players year in and year out, and I will never forget the first time I saw a BYU football player, okay? BYU came to my alma mater, University of Tulsa, when I was, you know, throwing women in the air, catching by their hands, whatnot, so forth, so on, being a cheerleader. And I looked around, and I said, is it me? Or is every one of these dudes look 35? And they said, no, nah, RJ, they, they go on mission trips, and then they come to school. I said, so what, you got a 23-year-old freshman? I thought I was joking. No, that's exactly what you got. You got 23-year-old freshmen. You got 27-year-old seniors. Yo, man, that's an NFL team. <laughs> like, what, what are we doing here? Those aren't children. Those aren't boys becoming men. Those are men with wives and children of their own. You don't want them problems in year one with a bunch of baby-faced dudes that don't know what this really is coming to your house in September, okay? Then you got Utah on November 19th, the defending Pac-12 champions. I expect them to be doing exactly what they usually do toward the end of the season, which is show up and throw it down, right? They've looked rocky to start some years, and then they come on strong, and they show everybody what's really good. They did that in a game that I thought Oregon should beat them down. They got they, – they, they beat down Oregon, okay? And your boy was really trying to gas Oregon up because they beat Ohio State, and what did they do but let me down? That's all I'm going to say. I mean, they let me down. Now, star players for you to know, Bo Nix, uh, running back Sean Dollar. I thought that Kirby Smart – was laying it on pretty thick in Destin when he told the Oregonian this about Bo Nix. It's a long quote, but I need to read it in entirety so you understand what I mean when I say he's laying it on thick. Quote, he's a great athlete, probably one of the best athletes I've ever seen at a quarterback in terms of GPS number, speed, overall athleticism. He's grown from being a freshman that was thrown in there playing under multiple coordinators and going back to a coordinator that he's familiar with, Kenny Dillingham. We'll get that in a second. And shouldn't make him comfortable. Very talented. We had a lot of draft picks on defense last year. And we struggled to get him to the ground. He's a tremendous player. All right, so I watched that game. And I made sure that I was right when I went to go look at Bo Nix's stats against Georgia. Yeah, all right, man. Um, no. He, he ran around a couple times. Had like 30 yards rushing or whatever. Had like 217 yards passing. Was like 50% completion. Nah. I, I, I really think that he's trying to sandbag old Dan and the Oregon fans who don't really know what's coming to them in Bo Nix, but they hope it's good. I also think that it's not great that you have a dude uh, that, frankly, 
is another version of Anthony Brown to me, and Oregon fans didn't seem to like Anthony Brown, even though I thought Anthony Brown was just fine. You're also dealing with Kenny Dillingham, who has, yes, some familiarity with one Bo Nix, but we're still talking about Kenny Dillingham being great at Memphis. We're not talking about him being great at a Power 5 program. Now, on defense, you got Tosh LePoy coordinating your defense. I think that's a pretty doggone good move. I remember Tosh LePoy at Alabama, and I was fond of it. You're also talking about a dude that's familiar with the Pac-12, having played at Cal, come up at Cal, worked his way up, was a defensive line coach for the Jacksonville Jaguars before taking this job in Eugene. Recruits for you to know. Of offensive tackle Josh Connerly and uh, transfer wide receiver Caleb Chapman. Josh Connerly just committed to <laughs> just committed to Oregon in April, which is ridiculous to think about. But he was the kind of dude that Washington wanted and that USC wanted. Uh, shout out to my managing editor Kevin Jackson, who keeps losing Washington recruits to almost everybody else. Emeka Agbuka, he's from Washington, yeah, Ohio State. JT Tuomola, he's from Washington, yeah, Ohio State. And now Connerly, who's from Seattle, down the road. Basically, you dub he going to Oregon. That's going to smart just a little bit. And wide receiver Caleb Chapman, I'm expecting him to have a really good year. Six foot five, tremendous range, coming out of Texas, coming out of Texas a and I think that he could be pretty good if they choose to make him into a dominant target. I reserve most of these. Let me go at this in a different way. I have a hard time. Saying things like 10 whims is a given here because you look at the schedule and people turn out to be better than you thought. But keep that 10 win expectation in your mind as I move into how will Mario Cristobal do in year one at Miami. Okay, let's lay this out. What What is what what is Mario Cristobal at Miami? It's a 10-year, $80 million contract, which was a lot of money. And then, you know, Brian Kelly took like 95 over 10, which is... Again, ridiculous, okay? I think at one point, Dabo Sweeney was like 93 over 10. Again, y'all want to stop dudes from making money playing football, but y'all don't want to stop dudes from making money coaching football? Hello? Anybody listening? Is anybody home? All right. They invested nearly, no, not nearly, more than $100 million in a new facility for football that Crystal Ball has described as, quote, space age, okay? That's in Coral Gables. He wants to put Coral Gables on par with Alabama and Oregon in terms of facilities. I say on par with Alabama and Oregon because he coached both places. Won a national championship at Alabama. You'll know this, right? And had a really good thing going at Oregon before he started to go back home, which is another thing. Getting to in a second. Billionaire booster John Ruiz has signed over 100 hurricane athletes to NIL deals, which is another way of saying, hey, if you come here, we're going to see to it that you get paid to come here. Okay. The university can't say it. Athletic department can't say it, but John Ruiz can say it. And he was an offensive lineman at Miami during that run in which they won two national championships and were 58 and 0. Mario Cristobal doesn't just know what it means for the U to be the U. He was a part of it when it was. That is what he is being charged with bringing back to Coral Gables. Okay. He asked for and received the highest budget for assistance in the entire ACC, added Josh Gaddis, Kevin Steele, who accepted the job in Maryland only to, you know, not even set up his office between before getting back down to Miami, who's also in his late 60s, and he has found roles in his program for former Miami Dolphins great Jason Taylor and former Miami great Alonzo Highsmith, okay? Then add to that, he's got tools to make a run 2022 based on what we saw in 2021 Manny Diaz so they beat Pitt on the road it's not insignificant it's not insignificant because Pitt played in a New Year's Six Bowl and Pitt won 11 games now what was squirrely was you have that loss right for Miami or excuse me for Pitt to Miami you also have <laughs> lost to Michigan State to Peach Bowl which I'll let go and then you have what I thought was really interesting the money in the bag honoree, Western Michigan, goes and gets a win against Pitt. Pitt was kind of all over the map. Okay. So now, Cristobal himself has said, 7-5 and five ain't going to cut it at the U. They went 7-5 and five last year. All right. He's returning these star players. Tyler Van Dyke, who some people are calling a first-round draft pick. I don't see it, but maybe they do. I, I, okay. They are also calling 
Offensive tackle Zion Nelson, a first-round draft pick. I do see it. That dude's 6'6", 325, and is going to be responsible for guarding that man's left-hand side as much as anything else. Now, what they also have that I thought was really interesting is running back in Jalen Knighton, who at one point, I didn't know if it was going to work out for him, but it absolutely has worked out for him, and they've added to that, okay? I think it's more interesting that we've seen Tyler Van Dyke say that he's working out Malik Rozier, but also saying that he's learning to throw the ball like Aaron uh, Aaron Donald, Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady throw the ball. It's more using his hip, you know, twerking his body. And I'm going, y'all are using terms like Alabama and Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady at Miami, knowing Miami ain't been Miami for 20 doggone years, okay? Then, recruits for you to know, or transfers for you to know, really. Running back, Henry Parrish, who's coming from Ole Miss. Wide receiver, Frank Ladson, who's coming from Clemson. And then, 2022 signee and incoming freshman, defensive end Cyrus Moss, who's every bit of six foot six, flying off the edge. He comes to an ardent key. He's an outstanding player. They'll have dudes. You're also talking about every ACC champion has averaged at least 33 points since 2009. Now, half full of that is last year with Rhett Lashley calling the plays, Miami averaged 34 points a game. But since 2017, basically in the era of Clemson, You've had to average 40 a game to win the ACC championship, and Miami has not averaged 40 points a game since 2002 when it last won the national championship. Now, if you can marry a great passing offense with Mario Cristobal and Alex Mirabal's ability to create great offensive line push by coaching the hell out of the offensive line, and you have a Ducks, or see Ducks, you have a Hurricanes defense that looks a lot like the Ducks defense did last year, see where I was going with that, you can begin to think about what Miami might look like given that its schedule breakdown is Texas A&M, okay, September 17th, I'm going to call that a loss, Virginia on October 29th, that could go either way, we'll talk a little bit about Tony Elliott a little bit later on this month, and then you're at Clemson on November 19th, not unlike Oregon, This year, I don't see a whole lot of hard, tough teams on Miami's schedule this year. Not to say say nothing of the ACC has looked as weak as it has looked in years, more or less because Clemson didn't play for the ACC title, right? They they, they didn't, they just weren't, they weren't good enough, even as they won 10 games, which is wild to think about because they were really great against teams that nobody else was watching, okay? Everybody forgot about Clemson after they lost to Georgia. Never mind, Georgia went and won a national championship. Now, Dabo Sweeney is also replacing both of his coordinators for the first time since he took over as head coach at Clemson. And I'm interested to see how that goes. Now, he elevated guys that know what the program is, know how they like to recruit, know what the strategy is, but it's not Brent Vittables, it's not Tony Elliott. Both of those guys have Power 5 jobs at places where I think they both could have outstanding first years in this season. So, last thing that I want to say about the Canes that I think is really interesting is this— I. I had a hard time wrapping my head around this when I saw the stat. The Canes are 24-3 and since 2016 and 7-0 and when they rush for 170 yards a game. So let me say that again. The Canes are 24-3 and since 2016 and 7-0 and on a seven-game win streak when they have rushed for at least 170 yards in a game. So if you are Mario Cristobal, And you already know your identity is running the football. And you have a quarterback like Tyler Van Dyke who is best at throwing the ball deep. Play action ought to be a part of everything you do, especially when you talk to Josh Gaddis. And when you do talk to Josh Gaddis, know that his Michigan offensive line and his Michigan running back room was one of the best in the country last year. They beat up on people, notably Ohio State, by running the football. Not by throwing the football are running the football, and when they took shots, they took shots deep down the field. I think Miami could be pretty doggone good. I'm just not sure about how good they can be. So, who will have the better first year? Dan Lanning at Oregon or Mario Cristobal at Miami? I'm going to say Mario Cristobal has a better shot to win 10 games this year than Dan Lanning does. I say that also knowing that you still have divisions, at least for this year, in the ACC, where you could just easily end up in the ACC championship game, and just the top two teams, in far as winning percentage, 
are going to get into the Pac-12 championship game. And I'm not sure that Oregon can be one of those two teams, though there are a lot of people that feel that they can be. For both of these teams, it's going to be how good are you at running the football and how good are you at playing defense, right? Seeing what you can get out of a Noah Sewell at Oregon is going to be paramount. Seeing what you can get out of Tyler Van Dyke in a year in which many people are thinking he could be Kenny Pickett is going to be paramount. I know that Mario Cristobal can coach at the head coaching level because I saw him do it at Oregon. I saw him do a bit of it, right, just in taking the job and how he accepted the job in Miami. But I also don't really know who Dan Lanning is as a head coach because he hasn't had this opportunity. I know he's a try hard. I know he's a hustle hard. I know that every single coach that has worked with him has – just been floored by his ability to just stay in the office and sleep on the floor and do whatever it takes to get opportunities. But I don't know how that translates to being the dude in charge who is at every single press conference and not just the ones where the bowl media makes you show up, who has to coach both on the field and through the media because, yes, you are speaking into a microphone more than you ever have in your entire life, and most of your job is about can I control the situation and the narrative as much as Can I get the most out of each of my 85 scholarship players? How do I stretch myself just thin enough so that we win just enough games for most people to think I did a good job? Mario Cristobal knows what he's walking into at Miami. He knows what it takes to coach to a conference championship. I'm going to give him the nod. Hey, kid folk, I appreciate you for watching. Subscribe here and ring the bell so you don't miss the latest upload to the channel. Also, be sure to watch more videos here like FS1 Studio Shows and the best from Fox Sports and Fox Sports Digital.